Harvard Divinity School. Ways of Knowing Through the Changing Landscapes of Esoteric Art, March 30th, 2022. Good afternoon and welcome to our Nosiology series. My name is Giovanna Parmigiani and I am the host of this series organized within the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative at the CSWR here at Harvard Divinity School. This series focuses on ways of knowing that are often labeled as non-rational, traditionally referred to as gnosis in Western philosophical and religious traditions and often understood in contraposition to science. These ways of knowing are becoming more and more influential in contemporary societies, popular culture and academic research. Going beyond dichotomies such as body and mind, ordinary and extraordinary reason and experience matter and spirit. This series will host scholars of different disciplines and practitioners interested in exploring and expanding the boundaries of what counts as knowledge today. So it is with immense pleasure that I introduce today's guest, Dr. Amy Hale. Dr. Hale is an Atlanta-based writer, curator, and art critic. She has a PhD in folklore and mythology from UCLA and has published academic popular articles on topics such as modern paganism, women's exoteric art, Cornwall, Arthurian lore, color theory, and occult performance art. She has written widely on artists and occultists Ethel Colhan, I hope I pronounce it uh, well, and her biography of Genius of the Fern Love Gully is available from Strange Attractor Press. She is also the editor of the recent collections Essays on Women in Western Esotericism, Beyond Seeresses and Sea Priestesses. And she's currently a curator and host for Victor Wynne's popular Last Tuesday Society lecture series, and has written gallery texts and essays for a number of institutions, including Tate, Camden Art Center, uh, Rusha Galleries, Hemily Records, and Spike Island, Bristol. Other essays can be found at her Medium site that you can find in the chat box, and her website that you can find in the chat box. Today, Amy and I will have a conversation on esoteric art, women artists, and feminism. Thank you, Amy, for being with us today and welcome virtually to HDS. Thank you so much, Giovanna. I'm really excited. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. As you know, I'm a fan of yours and your work. And so my students uh, of the magic and in the contemporary world uh, class that I teach whom you virtually visit in the fall, right? So thank you very much for being here again, uh, now for a wider audience, right? So um, let's lay some common grounds here. As you know, our audience is very variegated as uh, both of academics and non-academics. So let's start with um, what is esotericism? What is esoteric art? Why could it be considered a way of knowing in your opinion? Well, I love how you uh, start me off with the really low ball questions. Um, so I have some notes that I might refer to during this and also some visuals that I'll probably uh, bring into the conversation at some stage. So a lot of what we think of or, or what in, in the, um, in the academic discourse of esotericism. It's really been shaped by, I think, ideas of what has been framed as a uh, the Western esoteric tradition. And a lot of, there are a number of scholars, myself included, who are currently in the process of, of critiquing that and what we think of as esoteric practice, esoteric experience, even in some cases, esoteric belief. Um, one of the earliest people within that academic framework to produce a definition was Anton Feve. And he's a French scholar who actually held a chair of esotericism at the Sorbonne. And I think his definition has actually held up pretty well. He had six different criteria that he used. And the first four for me, I think are really resonate. So uh, the first one is the doctrine of living correspondences and the idea that all things are connected with each other. He also uses the idea of living nature. So kind of some people might call it animism itself, kind of a difficult term, but the idea of an inspirited universe. Uh, 
Also, he refers to the use of imagination. So uh, for some of you, think about visualization and the role of visualization in perhaps magical practice. And then finally, he refers to transmutation or the idea of, of, of change that we can actually use all four of these ideas together in various combinations to affect change. He refers to two other criteria of um, transmission and tradition. I kind of put those to one side. I think they're worth talking about in a lot of contexts, but for me, those four criteria are really hit at the center of what I use when I'm thinking about esotericism because they cover such a broad variety of experience and practice. Um, Wouter Honograph has a different definition he uses. He talks about the, uh, the idea of rejected knowledge and he refers, he calls it, he calls esotericism, uh, the, I think the dustbin of history. And I find that to be a little pejorative. It also means that it's in more in, he puts it more in dialogue with kind of major philosophical and intellectual movements in Europe. He tends to focus on Europe and European practice. Um, so that's not a definition that I use personally. I'm actually interested more in change, ideas of change, transformation, an inspirited universe. But I think it's also worth noting that esotericism frequently has a kind of challenging or uh, a, like a parallel relationship to what would be called official religiosity. So we have Christian esotericism, but that might sit in an uncomfortable position with what people might think of as official forms of Christianity. Of course, there are also relationships between esotericism and new religious movements. So um, I think those tend to feature a lot in, in the work that I do. Um, so would you like me to talk a little bit about, uh, where would you like me to go from there? <laughs> Yes, about art, maybe esoteric art. And also, uh, if I may, since, you know, this is an occasion for all of us to get to know not only your work, but you a little bit better. Why did you start to be interested in esotericism and in esoteric art? Can you, do you feel like telling us a little bit of your own sure. experience? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go into that before the, uh, before the, the other material. So uh, I actually grew up around art and artists. My mother was an artist and my father worked at the Detroit Institute. Uh, um, no, he worked for kind of like the, the city of Detroit and he was an art buyer and programmer for the city of Detroit when I was young. So I always grew up in a very arts focused household. And so I learned the vocabulary and structure of art and practice. I, I just grew up with it, it was in my house. I was, I've always been interested in esotericism. A lot of my anthropological work has focused on paganism, on the occult, uh, in you know, occult subcultures. So when I started working on the biography of Eiffel Colhoun, when I was working in Cornwall, it was not an extension of my interest in art per se, but it really was, uh, it was focusing on other intellectual and cultural themes that I was working with in, in my PhD and my work in Cornwall. Although having said that, having a PhD in folklore, you get a lot of, uh, of background in aesthetics. There's a huge aesthetic component to that degree, certainly as, as I was interested in it. So while I was doing the, the biography, I just started becoming interested in other questions about how people perceive the art that they do in this context, what it does for them, what it does for the audience, what is the relationship between the audience and the artist in that context. And it took me to all sorts of other really interesting places. I started doing work with Barry William Hale, more about him certainly throughout this presentation. Um, and then, I started getting asked by galleries to, to work with their artists. And so I've kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's transformed my life and career in ways that I had never anticipated, but in a way it also kind of feels like coming home because it was something that has always been a part of my life. And now I get to do that even more intensely and I love it. That's fantastic. And I, I 
well, you might want to tell us more uh, throughout the conversation, your background in ethnography might have played a role as well. Anyways, let's go in order. What is the esoteric <laughs> card for you? Um, why do you think it can be um, considered as a way of knowing? Okay, so if I can just, I might end up kind of bopping around my slides here a little bit. So I'm just gonna pull this up a little bit for uh, just to start giving a visual, some visual ideas about the range of esoteric art. You know, this is a, perhaps, it, these are three examples of what people might commonly think of as, as esoteric art. So on the far left, we have uh, a piece of medieval or Renaissance uh, alchemical art. And then in the center, we have a piece by Austin Osmond Spare, who was an English artist in the mid-century, um, very involved in the, uh, the occult scene there. And then on the far right, we have a psychedelic piece by the artist Alex Gray. And so these are, you know, these are commonly, I, I think it, there is a common perception perhaps among people who are interested in the occult and esoteric of what esoteric art looks like. I think people might be starting to develop their, their own idea of a visual canon. Uh, but it's really important that we don't have to know that we don't have a history of esoteric art in the same way that we do say surrealism or modernism. We're really retrofitting this category onto a bunch of pieces and, and performances because performance is also really important to me in the way that I look at this. We're kind of retrofitting and building this category. So I think of it as a very emergent ca category. And there are a whole bunch of things that can potentially fit into what is esoteric art. Um, I think that uh, for me, one of my starting places is actually looking at, uh, so alchemical art, let me see, I'm gonna go, can I go forward here? All right. so. I tend to think of the beginning of esoteric art as being uh, what I call kind of a symbolic didacticism. So back in the medieval and Renaissance period, when people had varying degrees of literacy, there were these books and encyclopedias of, of images that were to serve as allegories for specific teachings and ideas that artists might want to use in their work. So say, if you wanted to communicate something about purity, you might have a particular figure and artists would go to these, these dictionaries and they would, they would look at these symbols. And so you had this highly symbolic idea of what esoteric art was. And so in some of our earliest esoteric art and what a lot of people might think of as esoteric art today, we've got images like this piece on the right from an alchemical tradition, which was uh, to teach about alchemy, but also about spiritual precepts having to do with alchemy. And then on the right, we have a Masonic tracing board from the third degree of, uh, of the Masonic tradition. And these are very symbolic. And the idea is to, um, to transmit ideas about a very particular path when, but, Esotericism and esoteric art uh, is, I feel it's actually more about, the heart of it is about transformation. And so in this sense, obviously, we're, we're talking about um, ideas that would lead a person or a seeker on a path to transformation. But sometimes there is the role of the artist as communicating an experience that they had, which transformed them. And the viewer is also supposed to be transformed by that. I think that in esoteric art, a big key to what we see, if we want to talk about some precepts that kind of look that cross all of like the history of what we might call esoteric art is this idea that there is a relationship between the artist and perhaps other dimensions and the art and artist and the viewer. Of course, there's always a relationship between the art and the viewer, but I tend to think that part of the key of esoteric art is about revelation and is about transformation. And so those are some of the things that I tend to look at. Um, 
Can I ask you something right yeah. now? Because um, of course you're talking about transformation um, and the role of the visual, and I immediately think about sigils, right? right. Uh, and you mentioned sigils. Right. Can you tell us some more about you know maybe the role of sigils in esoteric art or how you know maybe this same idea is limiting of the scope of you know that, that I understand from you is broader than that, right? Yeah, I think that's a, a really, really great. Great question. Uh, again, because I think when people are thinking about the canon of esoteric art, they, they might get very focused on the fact that an artist is connected with a particular tradition. And so hold on just a second here, because I've got some, some notes, so I'm going to skip around just a little bit. So actually, so I'm going to look at uh, Barry William Hale. He's a, a really good example of a contemporary artist who uses sigils and sigil work. And uh, it's, it's really, it, I find that, that when we look at the role of, of sigils, there are a couple of different things that are going on. One is to communicate the relationship between an artist and a tradition. Um, so in this case, uh, Barry is, is using kind of the uh, a visual referent for, for viewers. He is, uh, he works within a number of different visual traditions, but this is kind of evoking for somebody, maybe a, a grimoire or, you know, a magic circle from a ceremonial tradition. And so there is, there's certainly, there's an interaction with a tradition, but there's also the idea that, a, that there is a spell, that something is happening that there is, again, a transformation occurring. So uh, another artist who I like to look at is Elijah Berger. Um, he works with, he's a queer artist who works in sigils that are derived from chaos magic. So these might be things that you might see they are similar to the kind that Austin Osman Spare created. Um, and so this is, this is not only a reference to that tradition, uh, and, it, you know, if you don't know what it is, it might look a little weird, you know, there might be a little bit of a tension when you're when you're looking at the piece, but it's also a, a spell. This is also a working. So both Elijah and Barry work with these traditions as spells. Um, yes, and I think we have to, sorry, maybe to explain to a, a, a wider audience what's a sigil, right? You see this little, sure, you know, sure. symbols and letters, and these are magical practices. Do you want to say more maybe about this? Because maybe some of us cannot um, refer in, immediately to what a sigil is. <laughs> so. Sure, sure. Because there are there are a number of different ways that, that sigils are created to represent particular magical ideas uh, entities or spells. So uh, traditionally, you might get a sigil, which would be an abstraction created in a very specific way. Won't get too much into that because we don't have time. Um, that would that would represent perhaps a planetary energy, or uh, an entity, or an angel. So those would be uh, early forms of sigils. There might be uh, alchemical. Uh, also alchemical symbols that might function as a sigil. A more contemporary sigil, which would be based on, again, Spare's method and the kind of thing that we're seeing in this particular piece, would be created for a specific idea or spell. It's a way that an artist might re or a magician would rearrange letters in order to create um, an idea that would be abstracted and then charged magically in order to send an intention out into the world. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Amy. Um, and and you know this is that's why is the go-to um, idea that scholars as us of magic and uh, esotericism think when we think about esoteric art, sigils and right. symbols. But that's right. not the whole story, right? <laughs> right, right, and, and I. I, I think it's very important to me since, you know, as I said, there, there are so many different ways of looking at esoteric art, the history, the category of it, that one of the things that I want to do, especially with my focus on women's esoteric art, is to kind of upend some of the history and the expectations, and even some of the categories that we might use to think of the development of esoteric art. So for instance, I'm really interested in the role of spiritualism the intersections of 
surrealism um, and how, at, how these play into a, a history when we talk about the history of it. And a lot of this ends up, a lot of the history of esoteric art actually ends up, uh, we end up talking about the early history of abstraction, which I think is really, really fascinating because so many people are focused uh, on esoteric art in terms of symbols, in terms of, of traditions that they can identify with and that are perhaps coded. And a lot of these abstractions are, are also coded, but they're, they're not representational. And so uh, the, the relationship between abstraction and esotericism is, is really profound. It's a huge area of interest for, uh, for art historians and scholars. And um, it's, it's kind of reshaping how we think about not just esoteric art, but also women's relationship to esoteric art. That's wonderful. Do you have any pictures for us? I mean, um, that show us a little bit some of the things you were mentioning, right? Sure. Sure. So that we can have some visual example and aids in order to, yes, thanks. <laughs> yes, I know I can, I can kind of, because I, I do have a lot. So if we want to look at, um, at uh, spiritualism, uh, I think one of the earliest examples of, uh, of esoteric art when we start talking about the modern era is actually the work that comes out of spiritualism. Spiritualism has always had a really rich visual tradition. Um, it happens to be, I think the earliest, in my view, the earliest way that we start seeing abstraction in esoteric art, it happens very, very early. It actually happens in the mid, we start seeing abst spiritualist abstractions in the early 19th century. I think I've got, I thought I had a Georgiana's Houghton's work in here. Nope, but I do not. Um, so we'll look at, at Hilma F. Clint. We'll look at some Georgiana Houghton a little bit later on. Hilma F. Clint was a, uh, she was a spiritualist, primarily motivated by the spiritualist tradition. She was also interested in theosophy and Rosicrucianism. Um, and she produced these incredible pieces of art decades before what we consider to be the beginning of abstraction. Um, so this is, I haven't talked much about symbolism. Symbolism is I think really could be wrong, but I think it's really the first time that we get the conscious blending of the occult subculture that was emerging in the 19th century with, with an art movement. So symbolism is a response to um, to Impressionism that comes out of France. It's very impactful on occult performance art and ritual that emerges in the 20th century. Uh, the symbolists were really about the ideal. They were about their Neoplatonists and they were really, they wanted to communicate these kind of mythic archetypal ideals to really elevate the human soul. So I think this is a beautiful piece by uh, Jean de Vie, which looks at some of the myth the idea of, of myth that was really permeating a lot of the art that they did. Theosophy had a huge impact on modern art, particularly abstract art. So the thought forms of Annie Besant and Ledbetter, this was an early 20th century book that posited the idea that your thoughts were, had a material substance that could be seen by psychics and that they were color coded so, you know, if you were thinking something bad, a psychic could see it. It was hanging out above your head. And they produced this, this book that talked about the shapes and the colors, this kind of shape and color mysticism that really impacted artists. Uh, theosophy was a very huge esoteric movement in the 19th and early 20th century, extremely influential. And so on the right, we have a piece by Kandinsky, who's often thought of as the father of um, of abstract art. And you can see kind of some of the similarities between that book cover and the piece that he created. A lot of people don't realize that Mondrian was also very impacted by theosophy. He was also very interested in the idea of the ideal. And so one of the things he was trying to paint was the structure of the universe. He thought that this was, he was trying to communicate this mystical ideal of color and shape as being the building blocks of the universe. So again, very early kind of uh, esoteric abstractions. Um, Georgiana Houghton, 
that was, let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna stop there with that. I do wanna talk a little bit about surrealism. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Surrealism had a lot of intersections with esotericism. Uh, the idea of automatic writing and painting, initially just writing, painting came later in the surrealist movement. Automatism, which was based in, in a spiritualism and spiritualist forms of communication with other dimensions, was very important to the surrealist movement. The key to the surrealist movement was actually getting, getting uh, in contact with your subconscious and your subconscious mind and producing art that overrode your conscious mind and overrode those uh, the, the, the logic, overrode um, your rationality and produced paintings that had a, a wider significance or maybe which were coming from other, other spirits or other dimensions. So spiritualism is also very, very important. Um, in the mid century, we start to also see kind of a divergence with, uh, I think, a particularly women's direction in esoteric art. But we can get onto that in maybe a minute. I'll let you look at this. And no, that's wonderful. Thank you for um, you no know, bringing us through. You know, these uh, brief uh, art history, uh, art, art uh, history of esoteric art, really. Um, and for showing up these images, I was interested uh, in knowing more about what do you think about the relationship between esoteric art and feminist art? Because some of the focus of your research are women um, artists. And we have, I will ask you questions from the audience that I see are they're interested also in the, um, in the, you know, uh, your work on women and in the feminist perspective that you are bringing to this. Sure. Um, so, There has been, as I've, you know, as I kind of keep saying, the role of women in esoteric art is significant. And I think that it's in many ways, it's its own, it's kind of, it's got its own, um, it's got its own trajectory. It's got a very particular trajectory. One of the things that I want to distinguish is the role of the idea of a feminine way of knowing, which I think was really critical to early esoteric art and feminist art. So the first kind of relies on these very essentialist ideas about women and particularly their spiritual capacities as mediums. And you know, they, it was very positively valued but whether or not it was, we would call that explicitly feminist is that that's kind of a hard call. I would imagine that a lot of the, the early esot women esoteric artists would not have considered themselves to be feminist. However, that idea that women were perhaps more in tune with nature, more in tune with the spirit world, less rational, you know, if we're gonna talk about ways of knowing, um, that played such an important role in early esoteric art. And it empowered, it actually empowered women to do really radical things. So this Georgiana Houghton piece, for instance, uh, she attributed this to Correggio, uh, who, you know, she believed that she was being inhabited by the guide of a Renaissance artist, which is interesting because it kind of then connects her to an artistic tradition, but of course, oh, this isn't mine. I totally did not do this. I'm not innovative. There's no ego here. This was somebody else's work. And we see this in Georgiana Houghton. We see this in Hilma F. Clint. Um, oh, I'm gonna get to her in a minute. Uh, so we, we see this over and over where, where the idea, the positioning of women and this feminist in this woman's way of knowing actually allows them to take chances and allows them to be really innovative in an artistic context. Now, later on, I mean, Ethel Colquhoun, it's funny, I'm actually not showing a lot of her, her work today. Uh, Ethel Colquhoun was remarkably feminist. Would she have called herself a feminist? Really good question. I call her a feminist, absolutely, because her interest in the divine feminist in the, the divine feminine and her ideas about women's equality 
uh, were were paramount to everything she created. So you know, was was she a feminist? You know, I, I yes, I, I think that she absolutely was. But we start seeing more engagement with feminist theory in esoteric art, with conversations about the divine feminine, with ideas of of the goddess. Very importantly, conversations about the witch. And as we start seeing witchcraft emerging as a new religious movement and people like Rosalie Norton, who identify themselves as witches, we start seeing the witch emerging as a very important feminist figure in esoteric art. Um, so I want to look a little bit. Uh, Monica Sue was very influenced by Maria Gimbutas and ideas of the divine feminine. She was really interested in the idea of the woman as the goddess in landscape. So we see quite a bit of that here where she's doing kind of this cross-cultural vision of, of the earth, the, the different ways that the earth and the, the care of the earth is really important in our understanding of women as representing the earth and the nurturing qualities of the earth. Um, in the 1980s, we also have this really interesting group, the neo-naturists, who intersected with kind of the, uh, the new romantic movement. They did performances in various spots in London. They would do performances at nightclubs, very invested in ideas of women, earth, and ritual. And again, ideas of fertility, which were very important to feminist art as it was emerging in the 1980s that also engaged with esotericism in a way that we might not see male artists do. Um, wanted to know Elizabeth Insomnia, who's a queer artist working in New York. Um, she does, she's very interested in the role of the divine feminine in the experience of the audience. So we see here, she has a scrying station set up where people can have their own experiences of the divine feminine as kind of this it's got this kind of performance aspect to it, which I think is, is really great. Um, Taishani, I'll be talking a bit about her too. She is really engaging with, as a number of contemporary artists are, um, a different form of feminist theory. So we're not talking anymore about essentialized ideas of feminine feminist knowing, but we're actually talking about the intersections with with feminist theory. And uh, this piece, the neon hieroglyph, is a number of different pieces across a number of different media, which in, in her work in general, she's aiming to break down structures that are oppressive. So she's aiming to break down patriarchal frameworks that are seen as keeping us from knowing further. So this is a project based around a feminist, uh, a feminist history of psychedelia, and particularly around the, a mythic history of ergot, which is a uh, kind of it's the, the, the base form of LSD. It is something that is found on rye bread, and there are all of these great stories, uh, many of them Italian. So Giovanna, perhaps you're familiar with some of these ideas of, of whole towns kind of tripping and uh, she has a particularly interesting revolutionary consciousness in her work around those stories, which is, is very feminist in orientation. So that's kind of a bit of a ride through how I make those distinctions between this feminist, this, this essentialized woman's way of knowing or feminine way of knowing and the intersections of esoteric art with feminist thought which is what we're seeing now, more of a move out of ideas of essentialism and essentialist, the idea of an essential woman or an essential feminine and using feminist thought to really uh, communicate very different things about, about structure, about time, about history, about story. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Amy, for um, letting us understand um, the development uh, of what you're studying uh, by giving it the complexity that it deserves, actually. And, and so thank you for all the textures that you're offering us uh, in order to better understand what's at stake here. I have oh, a couple of questions. Sorry? 
I know we're having a bit of a romp, but I have so much great stuff that I want to share with everybody. That's very, that's true. But, you know, um, I think there's like, there are a couple of questions from the audience that yeah. might be relevant to um, some of the things that you just said. So one from Amanda, who asked, is asking, are there examples of women artists, maybe Remedios Faro, Hima Clint, who are actually in Western mystery tradition based slash esoteric in initiatory orders? And if so, and this is a question, was their work taken seriously within that context? Um, and the other question, which I think is, you know, um, might be uh, also linked to this one is from Andrew. Um, I get the impression that women artists work in esoteric art were more collaborative with each other than men who are regarded as solitary in a studio. For example, the early Hilmaf Clint and her friends and Remedios Varen and Eleanor Carrington. Am I right in my impression? Mm. Um, so, um... To start with, with the uh, the first one, Andrea's question about women in esoteric orders. So yes, Hilma F. Clint, uh, well, was she an initiate of, of an esoteric order? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if she was an initiate of any early Rosicrucian order. She was certainly interested in those ideas and we see them in her work. Ethel Calhoun was absolutely an initiate of almost every esoteric order you can think of. She was a Druid. She was involved in the OTO. She was, uh, she was driven by the Golden Dawn, uh, although she was only an initiate of a Golden Dawn type order later in her life. She was a Martinist. So yes, she was, she was absolutely an initiate. Uh, I think there's also a, a distinction when you talk about Carrington and, and Varro. Were they initiates or did they have a practice? We know that Carrington and Varro absolutely did have practices. They were interested in witchcraft. They were interested in witch traditions. I believe that they both created tarot decks. Leonora Carrington's tarot deck is absolutely stunning. So did they have practices? Yes. Now, were these women artists taken seriously in those contexts? we're really only now starting to understand and appreciate the role of women within esoteric movements and within occult movements. If we think specifically about what we will call like, you know, the Western mystery tradition and all of those things that we, the groups we associate with the occult revival. There absolutely were and have been women who have been involved but their voices have just not been as loud. And I think a lot of reason, the reason is because frankly, they weren't publishing books saying, hi, I'm the great teacher. I mean, obviously Helena Blavatsky did, but uh, a lot of women were not putting themselves out there in those contexts in the same way. So we're really on a journey right now of trying to understand what they did. Obviously, Aitha Colhoun was a very well-known artist in her day. She did very well. She was very open about her influences, but within that milieu, um, you know, my dear friend Barry Pale says that uh, it's part of his mission to try to raise artistic literacy within that, within the occult movement and environment. And, you know, I think the, how do those, how, how do those groups, how do they intersect? How do art movements and occult movements intersect is, is another story. Oh, Rosalie Norton, she's another really great example of, of an artist who absolutely had a practice and she, uh, I believe was arrested for it more than once. She was radical, she was absolutely wonderful. Um, the second question, can you remind me of the second question from Andrew, I think? Yes, the collaborate, collaborative um, dimension of women's artist work uh, rather vis-a-vis -vis men's artists. Um, I think some did. I think some didn't. I mean, I think there are uh, a lot of examples, obviously, of men working together and creating together in artistic communities. You know, we find that certainly with with the uh, the kind of the artist colony model. We see that a lot with abstract esotericism, abstract esotericism, abstract expressionism. So a lot of those artists work in collaboration together. Certainly the modernists down in St. Ives work a lot together and there was a lot of intersection. Uh, I wouldn't want to project the idea of collaboration onto women as a kind of, because we have ideas about 
women's collectives. I don't think that they were necessarily any more um, profound than men. I mean, Eiffel Calhoun worked alone and a lot of these artists did. So I wouldn't want to project that onto women as a particular artistic value, but in the case of, of maybe some earlier artists, it did help provide a context for how they viewed what they were doing. Because the idea of being, you know, Hilma F. Clint, first abstract artist, was not something that she could have done at the time. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so going back to a more contemporary esoteric artist, um, um, is there someone who's particularly relevant to you and that you want to tell us a, a bit more about? Um, I don't know, uh, it's a pretty open question, but I feel like you're so passionate about um, the study that, you know, um, I'm glad to, I think we are all glad to know, um, yeah, something about your own passions and attitude towards, you know, what you study. Sure, so, so obviously, uh, Eiffel Colhoun, uh, about whom I wrote a biography. Excuse me, I need <clears throat> a frog. Obviously, I'm very passionate about Ethel Colhoun. Um, I think she was one of the most important occultists of any gender in the 20th century. And I'm still very engaged with her work. I'm very engaged with her work as a, as a writer and essayist as a, in addition to her painting. So that's kind of the next phase of, of that project. Um, but there are a, some other artists who I really want to highlight who are kind of piquing my, my interest at the moment. Some of these I don't necessarily know a whole lot about, but I think that they're, they, they deserve to be seen within, within, this, uh, within the story that we tell about esoteric art. Betty Saar is, she, she is known as an African-American artist and does a lot of work about uh, racism and uh, racial dynamics in the United States. But she has created a number of things that relate to African-American esoteric traditions. So she has done, this is, is a really famous piece called Black Girl's Window. It's got tarot cards, it's got alchemical symbols. It's absolutely wonderful. She's done uh, pieces that relate to the idea of, of Egypt in African-American esotericism. I think she's, she's really important. And when we talk about esoteric art, I think we should be also talking about Betty Saar. Um, other artists who mean a lot to me, Barry William Hale, I've done some, some work on him. Uh, he is not just a meticulous visual artist who brings together a range of international influences in his work, but his ritual performance is stunning. It's effective. Uh, I don't think I'll ever get to the bottom of how effective he is. I, I love his work. I'm also really interested in looking at the work of Björk. I don't think a lot of people think of her particularly as an esoteric artist. They might think of her as an avant-garde artist, but if you think of what she's doing with biophilia, she fits into a lot of the themes that I'm really looking at right now about hybridity, about um, uh, the, the inspirited universe, about interconnectedness. So, and I just, I, I love her. I think she's fantastic. Um, so I'm, those are those are a few who uh, are, you know, kind of emerging onto my radar or who have been firmly on it for quite some time. But it's a really exciting place to look. Oh, and obviously I also have to mention Tai Shani. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work with her. Um, she is so smart, so thoughtful, so forward thinking. You know, she's always five steps ahead of me. But I, I love, I love working with with Tai. She's taken me to all sorts of great places. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I have a kind of self-interested question here since we're both ethnographers and I'm very curious about methods and you know how you um, you're being an ethnographer. How was being an ethnographer in this particular field and world? Um, did it help you? Did it make you, make you th think about things and see things differently? Do you want to speak as uh, more about, tell us more about this. Um. Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is why it's, it's 
a lot of the work that I'm doing right now for, for galleries and museums has really come out of left field. Uh, I'm not an art historian, just right up front in, uh, in the book on Eiffel Calhoun. I'm, I approach this as somebody who's really interested in art in context, in the response of the audience, which has a million different contexts in itself. But when I work with artists, uh, like like when I work with with uh, with Barry or or Ty, uh, I I interview them, and I would imagine that other people do that as well. But I feel that it's it's not so much that I want to impose their view on their art because I believe that art is obviously co-created in any given moment. Um, but I think that there's something I feel like there's there's something about the way that I, I, I speak with an artist and I want to understand their own understanding of their work and also of their practice. How does that, how does that shape? Because I, I, I work with people who are practitioners to some degree or another. How does that inform what they do? And what is it that we as an audience need to know to really experience their work? Or sometimes what are some of the things, cause I know that this happens, you know, the ethnographer always does, does this dance of what is it that people are saying about what they do and what other things are they actually doing when, when we're analyzing, when we're analyzing a, a, any kind of phenomena through an ethnographic lens. And, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the feedback that I offer the artist in conversation uh, can can be surprising to them as well. So yeah, I think it, it's a slightly different voice that I write with than a lot of our historians. And I, perhaps people find that refreshing, I don't know. No, very much. And I'm very curious about the aspect of transformation that you were mentioning and how this actually emerges from the conversation slash interviews that you have the chance to do with your um, interlocutors, artists. and. Um, is this is transformation an explicit dimension of their um, expressive needs or you know intents? Did, did you find that as you know explicitly um, mentioned? I yeah I so I think uh, I feel like it is. I feel like it is. I think some artists I've worked with are more explicit about that than others. Um, but certainly for Ethel Colquhoun, who sadly she passed on long before I started writing about her, uh, but she was very interested in transformation and she, she wanted people to use, especially later on in her life, she wanted people to engage with her art in a way that would spiritually transform them. For some artists, when I've worked with, say, for instance, uh, Barry Hale, he is very clear that he is, these are operations, these are magical, he works with magical concepts, spell work, op, you know, that may not be the right word for him, um, he'll tell me later if it's not, uh, but he, he, he performs magical operations with his work, so there is very clearly a tent, uh, an, 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 uh, an intent for transformation, both for him and uh, this kind of empirical sense of I'm doing an operation, if it's done properly, then there will be an effect. Some of the other uh, uh, more feminist artists I work with who are doing things perhaps more conceptually, I tend to think that they're transforming, perhaps their idea is to transform how we think and experience things like time and bodies and structure and maybe hoping that we have can have a slightly different view of the future going forward, which I think is kind of something we all sort of need right now. So yeah, I think it's key. I think it's actually critical to the esoteric art experience. And I see a political dimension in all this. It might be me, just my gaze, <laughs> since I'm interested in women, you know, religion and politics. But there's a tr this transformation to me, especially in the feminist artists that we were mentioning, might lead towards, you know, more kind of political or, you know, um, so socially engaged way to um, think about art as well. Um, Absolutely. I'm, Absolutely. I'm, I'm really interested in... Uh, 
how people use, how, how contemporary artists in particular, both male and female, use the idea of the witch to talk about ideas of collectivity. Uh, I, I really, really want to write about that at some stage because uh, Tai Shani does it. Another artist I've worked with in Wales, John Abel, uh, does this. You know, we often think of the witch as kind of a lone figure, but of course the coven has meaning. The coven has a lot of meaning and the coven can get together to change things. And so that when, when artists use the witch as this icon of, of radical collectivity and in Tai Shani's case at, for this, this, kind, this very communist ideal of redistribution and of justice, I love that. I love that. And you know, witchcraft does great things in contemporary esoteric art. It really does. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. I, I really hope you will write about this specifically in the future. Um, uh, I think it's very fascinating. Uh, I have a few questions from the audience, very many. So I try to give some space right. to our audience. Um, yeah, let's do that. Because I know we've only got a few minutes left. So let's, yes. let's go for it. <laughs> Are there any female artists that represent notions of the spiritual battle of, battle of mental illness? Um, I would say that, uh, that probably a lot, yes. Uh, it's not an area that I work with specifically, so I can't speak to that idea. You know, I think that there would be a, a question about what the esoteric reframing of mental illness is within this context because that's such a wide range of, uh, that's such a wide topic, but I haven't actually investigated that. Um, I, I expect that that will also be an emerging theme. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, thank you so much. Um, Olga asks, can you please tell us a bit more about how the alchemical images from the Middle Ages you were used in esoteric art? Sure, um, that is, a lot of artists, I think specifically, we see it in the, the surrealists, kind of reclaimed uh, or used or were fascinated by alchemical art because it's, it's wacky. I mean, it's, it's wacky, it's highly symbolic, and it really fit into the idea of, of, uh, of dream imagery and subconscious imagery that was so important to the surrealists. So we see a lot of surrealists who use like Max Ernst is a really great example who uses uh, alchemical imagery. Um, so we actually, it's interesting, we see it here in, in Betty, Betty Sarr's work. We see you know, the, the lion eating the sun, which is an alchemical emblem. I think that there are a couple of different references there. You know, when, when esoteric artists use alchemical Im imagery, it is certainly a nod to tradition. It's a nod to a visual tradition that is exceptionally unusual and also exceptionally um, you know, pregnant with meaning. Um, and I think that for, there are a number of artists who take alchemical symbols and uh, John Abel is another really great example. He, he uses alchemical imagery just kind of as, as little markers to kind of, to, to kind of tweak something in you. Now, how do the artists think that this works? Do they think, you know, that how, how do they think that the alchemical symbol that they're using in their art works? I think that's probably something which varies greatly from artist to artist. Thank you very much, Amy. And I have a last question from our colleague, Anne Brody. Um, she has a question on um, tradition to refer to spiritualism, theosophy, and other modern movements. Don't the artists and practitioners view themselves as experimenting with something new rather than adding into a tradition? Do you see the artists as locating themselves in relation to history or as rejecting historical frameworks to explore spiritual connections outside of temporality? That's a fantastic question. That's a question. That's <laughs> really great. And it's, it, that varies that varies widely. 
So I think that for some artists, it's very important to them that they are seen as belonging to either a spiritual or, or uh, a, a spiritual or, you know, for them, religious tradition, um, that, that they are seen as representing that and working within it. I think that is very important to some because the idea of lineage, of, of, of current, of tradition, and representing that in a, in a faithful way is very important. Ethel Calhoun, of course, was not only interested in and in, in wanting to, even though she did it in really unconventional ways, she felt that she was representing uh, a, a spiritual current in a very faithful way. She was also an extreme adherent in, in she, she considered herself an orthodox surrealist until the end of her life. So yes, a lot for a lot of these artists, the idea of, of history, tradition, current is very important. For some, however, for some of the more contemporary artists that I'm, I'm working with, they may see themselves as engaging with history and engaging with various discourses, but they don't want, a number of them are explicit about wanting to break them, about wanting to completely um, change the way in which we see structure, history, tradition. And so they're, they're commenting on those ideas, but they're not trying to replicate them. They're trying to take us in a different direction. I won't even say forward. I won't say they're trying to take us forward. They're trying to make us think very differently about, about all of the structures which confine us. Um, but some of them do that with, with, uh, by referencing tradition. So it's, it's, kind of a, it's, it's kind of an interesting dance that they do, but that's a fantastic question. Thank you very, very much, Amy. I think it's time to wrap up now. Um, thank you, Amy, for your participation and wonderful conversation, for answering all these questions. And thank you uh, all for having been with us. And just a reminder, this event is recorded and the recording will be shared on YouTube um, uh, soon, in the next weeks. So all the questions that you ask will be um, uh, forwarded to uh, Dr. Hale. And if you have more, you can send them over to me by email. So please stay tuned on the activities of the CSWR, uh, the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative, and of Nosiologies. You can find all this information on the CSWR website, link here in the chat box, including the registration link for our new um, next Nosiologies event that will be on April 13th. And it will be a conversation with Dr. Eric Davis on his book, Technosis, Myth, Magic, and Mysticism in the Age of Information, with some dives into AI, post-truth polarizations, the simulation hypothesis, the explosion of digital occultism, Insta witches, and TikTok reality shifters. So thank you, Amy. Thank you all for having been with us. And I wish you all a great rest of the day. Thank, thank you, so everyone. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.